morning. Uh, this is Bob and welcome to the Highway Podcast. Um, we haven't done a podcast for about a week. Uh, it's been a bit remiss of me. I've been not been lazy. I've been doing other things online. Uh, so we're kickstarting it with uh, a chap that I know quite well, Baz, Baz Cannon. He's a digital artist. He does Muay Thai. He practices meditation and brings up some really interesting topics in some of the groups that we run online. He's got a, quite a big presence online uh, but you can check out his links in the comments box below. Um, you'll, you can link to his Instagram account and, of course, his Twitter account. Baz, good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me on. I actually feel uh, honoured to be on this podcast. Uh, the Highway Podcast, I believe it's called. The Highway Podcast for higher yeah. things. That's why we've got you on, Baz. <laughs> so Absolutely. we can talk about things of a higher nature. But uh, I'm going to stop you there because I want to... I read your profile, obviously, and I've known you for a while, but I didn't know really that you were a digital artist. I've worked in digital media for a long time, computer games and so on. But what 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 is a digital artist? Just so there's somebody out there might not know what it is. So in terms of uh, being a digital artist, what digital art essentially is, it's essentially just creating... Uh, images like image manipulation. So you, you would use software like Photoshop, which is a classic example of uh, digital art and oh, photo right. manipulation. So I can tell you, I can share some details on how it works essentially. Like mm. generally when I'm editing my photos, I'm generally combining different elements of other images into one. So it appears as though it's one whole image, but actually it's multiple different images like combined together with some filters and fancy effects applied to it and things like that. And that's generally the approach I go for when I'm creating my images. Like uh, okay. you'll see, you'll find some video tutorials online which shows you step-by-step step how to do it. I mean, I haven't done any tutorials yet, but I'm planning on doing that sometime in the future. But generally if you go on YouTube and type in Photoshop tutorials for beginners, then yeah, you'll see the process just exactly as to how it's done. And there's even tutorials for like movie posters. So generally I would uh, follow the tutorials uh, learn the concepts, internalize it. And then once I understand how it works, then I can try to figure out, okay, how did I, how did this person create the movie poster for let's say Avengers, for example. Oh yeah. And then yeah. I, would think, yeah. I would think back to, uh, you know, what I did in my previous work, which I can apply for this one. And sometimes it takes a bit of trial and error. Like I have to experiment, find out what works and what doesn't work. And then once I'm satisfied with the result, generally that's when I go about uploading it. But generally before I upload it, I share it with uh, like some close friends of mine just uh -huh. to get like a second pair of eyes because I think that definitely helps oh yeah in the yeah. sense that um you know there might there might be some things which you know I might have missed which he can spot so blind spots as you call them oh, and then okay. once and once he approves of it then that's generally when I start rolling out the uploads so generally the process is such that yeah I will go out with some friends I'll take some photographs I'll also go on stock image stock image websites where I'll download some images which you know are copyright free and i get permission to use obviously mm. and i'll start throwing that into my workspace and then once i do that then i export the image and then uh, it's uh, uploaded onto my social media platforms so have you have you ever sort of been paid for this work do you do it professionally is what i'm saying i guess uh currently i just do it as like a side project i mean i have worked with a couple of clients where i have got paid for the work but generally it's more of a fun hobby on the side as of right now right. like full-time i actually work as a software engineer on a graduate scheme like i just graduated just uh, recently in july for my master's that's I know, what i was I gonna ask you i was gonna ask you um what did you graduate in Oh, so it's kind of a funny one, actually. So I did three years of economics, like a BSc in economics. And then I did like a master's in computer science, which is a one-year program at the University of Birmingham. Right. And normally I'd graduate in December, but I had to defer a couple of my exams due to some personal circumstances with right. my family and things right. like that. So I ended up graduating a lot later than the usual. A bit later than everybody else, but I'm still where I want to be. So I'm pretty happy in terms yeah, of but that. you're still young. I mean, I'm I didn't turn 24 this weekend. <laughs> I didn't graduate till I was 33. <laughs> Albeit I started when I was 29. But <laughs> so I wouldn't worry about that. You have more experience as you're older, don't you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm just happy I don't have to do exams for the rest of my life. Yeah, anymore. that's it. Oh God, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've um I've had friends who are medical students and like 10 years down the line and they're still taking exams, you know. And I think <laughs> law law is another one, isn't it? An accountancy. You're constantly taking exams like, yeah. 
So your, your first degree was in economics, yeah? Where, where, where did you do that then? Was that at Birmingham as well? or? Yeah, that was also at Birmingham University. Oh, so you, uh, okay, so do you live in Birmingham? Yeah, I'm from Birmingham. I actually went to school in Birmingham. I went to one of the grammar schools. Which one? Uh, King Edwards. Oh, yeah? Opposite the university or uh, five no, ways? There's different branches. Like, obviously five one, ways? Not five ways, Aston. Oh, Aston. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh, it's got quite a reputation, hasn't it? Yeah, definitely. How did so? The question: How did you get in there? <laughs> I, I, can, I can talk about this. Yeah, uh, I didn't get into King Edward's Aston until sixth form. Like, I did my GCSEs at a different school. Right. And, uh, I can talk about my story there, since yeah, I did struggle a lot academically initially, but then, uh, you know, with with the right mindset, I was able to push through the exams and not listen to the limiting beliefs which were projected onto me from like society and some of the teachers there I mean I had that self-belief that yeah I am capable of getting into a top school so I but, yeah yeah so would you it's fair to say then because you hear this all the time don't you, you hear because I know I didn't work as well at school as I did much later uh, and yet I would read book after book after book and I was fascinated by philosophy by maths by physics by science but I never felt the teachers valued that sort of thing. And it was like, um, you just do what we tell you rather than follow. It wasn't really about education or thinking. It was just about, you have to tick this box to get this, what we in those days called all levels, which are like the GCSEs. Um, and of course, because of that, I, I, I was really, I never attended school in my final years. And then I was sort of, funneled by the system to doing an apprenticeship rather than become a journalist which is what I wanted to do so I can see exactly what you're saying so you were able to you, you had a bit of a struggle at school obviously secondary school so what I, made what made you get that switch what what made you decide I'm not going to listen to them you call them limiting beliefs which is just exactly what they are what made you decide right I'm not going to listen to what they're saying or trying to do to me I'm going to just do it and what, what was that? What drove you to do that? Yeah, so actually, like, obviously, I talked about the, the issues I had, like, you know, with bullying and, you know, limiting beliefs projected onto me by teachers. And this yeah. understanding that, you know, they just, they have insecurities as well, like everybody else. And it's, oh, just, of course, like, yeah. it's just knowing that, it's just being aware that, yeah, that's what they're projecting and they're not actually speaking, like, in terms of where they're coming from, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. in terms of motivation, like, I did, I was actually part of a community, like the South Indian community, where I had like friends who went to the grammar schools. So I kind of I kind of had an idea of, you know, what their schedule was like and, you know, what their work hours was like and, you know, just how much effort they put into exams and things like that. So yeah. I thought to myself, if they're working this hard and getting to where they want to be, then, you know, I surely I can do the same, right? So, you know, I started, I started to ask them for help. I asked them for advice. You know, I was taking tips from them, you know, implementing different strategies, finding out what works for me in terms of revision and then just doing what I need to do to, get the grades I want and ultimately get to where I want to be. So as for GCSEs, like it was a different league compared to the grammar schools. Like right. if I were to get the same grades at that school I went to in a grammar school, like it would be considered like average or not great. But with the school I went to, it was actually part of the top 10. So uh, I think it's success is relative in that sense. Yeah. Like someone would think six, eight stars at GCSE is not great in a grammar school, but at the school I went to, like, that would be considered an achievement. Like in terms of the actual grades I got, it was, I believe it was two A stars and a B in English. Yeah, I sucked at English <laughs> and yeah, yeah. everything else, yeah. And I think uh, my teachers, they had, predicted, they had predicted me grades like a lot lower than what I actually ended up achieving. And then when I- <laughs> That's always a good feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember one of my teachers literally said to me, like, you're gonna get a C in science. And then that kind of, I kind of just used that as motivation to you know, I guess proved them wrong because I'll be honest, it's more fun proving someone wrong than right, right? I agree completely with that. I'm, I'm a polarity, I, we call that a polarity responder. And that's, that's exactly what I do. If somebody says I can't do something, I go, oh, okay, let's see. <laughs> always, it's always a great feeling to prove people wrong because invariably they are, aren't they? You know? Yeah. Uh, and they're, as you've said, they're putting their limiting beliefs onto you. That's a belief they have. Let them keep it. You've got your own way of thinking and seeing the world. Yeah, absolutely. It just means that, you know, they themselves can't imagine themselves doing it. So 
what they see is they believe everyone else should see the same, but it's not necessarily the case, right? So, no. So you saw yourself as something a lot better. Yeah, absolutely. It's like knowing what's possible. And I think a lot of it comes down to mindset because if you have the right beliefs and the right mindset, then anything is possible. And I've definitely noticed this in the last five years of my life. Like once I found out about personal development, and that's, that brings me to another point, actually. Like, I felt yeah. like in schools, they only taught you things like algebra or Pythagoras theorem and all that useless crap, which I don't remember after my exams. That you'll and never, they, ever have to use again. I never I never do to no, this day. No, no. Yeah, and I didn't, not once did they talk about personal development or mindset or anything. So I had no clue for a long time until I came across a friend who... You know, he was getting into business and things like that. And he was telling me about all about this mindset stuff. And that really got me intrigued. Mm -hmm. So that's what motivated me to learn more about this, learn more about the mindset, how it works. And, you know, and of course, surrounding yourself with the right people. Because I felt like the secondary school I went to, it was quite a toxic environment to be in since, yeah, there were a lot of people who weren't necessarily like ambitious or people I necessarily wanted to associate with. Yeah. So for a long time, I did feel like quite, I guess, alone or felt like an outsider. Yeah, not, I know not, exactly not. what you mean, you know? It's funny that because that's exactly how I felt when I was in secondary school. I thought I didn't belong here. Some some of my friends at school called me the professor because I was always reading books but never turning up for school hardly. Uh, but I knew all sorts of things, you know? I was learning all sorts of things, not considered valuable by the teachers, of course. Um, so, yeah, and like yourself, I got bullied at school as well. Um, but that, like you say, it can do one or two things. It can turn you into just another sad person who's been bullied and lives their life at the lowest point, never fulfilling their potential, whatever that could be. Or you can sort of rise above it and go, well, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. So it seems, yeah, similar, similar story, Baz, similar story, you know. And you can be held back by your parents and the people, particularly the schools and your friends at school. Even though you're friends, you look at them and you go, well, I don't, <laughs> they have no interests. So, yeah, I'm sure you, you probably, I don't know, but certainly my experience is I've spoken on Facebook and so on with some of the people I used to know back in those days. And they, their lives are quite, I mean, I can only say what I see, but they're quite miserable and they're very, um, they're in their 60s now and it's like they've given up now. It's like, oh, well, I'm just going to get old and do nothing. Um, I think you'll find that will happen as you get older as well. If you keep in that same frame of mind, you know, that the people around you will stagnate, but you'll continue to change every day and grow and learn new things. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like a lot of it just comes down to insecurity. And generally, you've heard the saying, misery loves company, right? So people, if people feel like unsatisfied with their lives, then they're going to try and project that onto everyone else just to make themselves feel like, oh, I'm not the only one suffering, right? So it's not, I'm not saying it's right. And like, you know, that's, but that's just the reality of it, really. But of course, my mission is to try and uh, help inspire people, help people get out of that mindset because you know I was also guilty of that too like I used to be one of those haters as you call it where like I actually had this friend who uh he used to get like top grades like better grades than me and I know that my parents even though they meant well and stuff like they were constantly comparing me to him and that just made me feel like really insecure about myself and what I ended up doing was as soon as I found out that he slipped up in a mock exam or whatever then that would make me feel better I'm not I'm not <laughs> saying what I did was right but <laughs> no but yeah. that's how you were at the time yeah yeah like I was just projecting my own insecurities. Like he was, he was really great at what he does, but yeah, it was just, cause I wasn't satisfied with myself. Like I kind of, it's kind of like, I kind of wanted to knock everyone else's building. So I was in that position at one point in my life. I mean, I'm not like that anymore. Like I want to encourage people. I want to be happy for everyone else, but that's all it is essentially. It's just, it's just insecurity. And, uh, and the way to fix that is to make shifts in your mindset so that um, instead of feeling like you have to bring everyone down, you can raise yourself up so you can meet, be at their level. Mm and uh, inspire others and surrounding yourself with people who are on who are also on that self-improvement journey and I feel like it's, it's definitely easier to be in that environment like once you leave school because I felt like in school like you're kind of just stuck with the people you're with in the classroom but then after I left it's like I had more control like I can choose who I want to be around and you know if someone's not serving me then uh, yeah I can just distance myself and then find someone who is going to serve me yeah. so yeah 
that's essentially what it is really so it's about See, the, the thing that's missing and you you sort of mentioned it earlier on about school they teach you algebra trigonometry you know um shakespeare uh, and it's all done in a very dry manner anyway, usually, not always. There's always one or two interesting teachers that, that, that there might be in the school. I know I had one who was a brilliant English teacher and he sort of gave me a love of literature just because of his enthusiasm. Um, but what, what you really need is a manual for the brain. When you're born, they should give you a manual for the brain. <laughs> you know, this is how your brain works. This is what it's going to do to you to screw you up if you're not careful. And this is how you can use your brain to make some changes, not just in your life, but in other people's. Because whatever actions you perform in, in this life will affect others around you, as you've already alluded to. You know, when haters... It causes nothing but aggro, dissent, um, jealousies. And you see it on Facebook, don't you, all the time? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and you also see the opposite, which is people saying, look at my life, isn't it amazing? <laughs> <laughs> and you go, why are you putting that? Why are you putting that on Facebook? I, that, it's bizarre, you know. But, I mean, that's what people do now. Um, everything's open, isn't it? It's like on a plate. Uh, warts and all and you sometimes wonder how much of that is a front because they need to show that to make themselves look successful yeah it comes from that feeling of like it's having that belief that you are enough as you are and you yeah. know, there's a lot of people out there who feel like oh they gotta overcompensate and i was guilty of this too like i used yeah, to yeah. a lot of traveling photos of me and i was like oh look at me i'm so great but it's like yeah deep down like yeah i just felt like i was just trying to get validation but i'm trying to stay away from that now and focus yeah, on yeah yes i mean what's what sort of so that there must have been i guess influences early on um you've already mentioned you know uh, some of the guys at the grammar school sort of helped you because you approached them for help and they sort of help you with strategies um can you pick any is there, are there any significant characters who might be famous or, or not famous who were, I guess, instrumental in changing your mindset, that switch, who created that? In, in terms of changing my mindset, there was this one particular guy who I met through a mutual friend of mine. Like, uh, we didn't speak much, but then we was like, I added him on like social media. We started talking on there and he was telling me about how he's getting into like, personal development mindset and he, he likes to go to the gym a lot and lift weights and yeah he was essentially telling me that yeah like a lot of people who hate or who have these insecurities like it's usually because they don't really have an awful lot going for them so they try to project their own beliefs and then it's just making sure I don't fall into those traps and just realizing that yeah with the right mindset like anything is possible like your potential is a lot greater than you initially think and it's about keeping an open mind as well and just being willing to face the pain and punching fear in the face, as you call it, and just pushing through those challenges to eventually grow. Like, yeah. I feel like society has this view that, oh, if you fail at something, then it's bad. But I feel like failure is just feedback at the end of the day. Like, it took me a while to internalize this, because I remember every time I failed an exam or whatever, I used to feel like, like, terrible about it. Yeah. But then, like, once I started surrounding myself with the right people who are also on that self-improvement journey that made me realize okay failure isn't so bad after all you can use it as a learning experience then eventually you'll get the success you want like it's only a matter of time right so just absolutely keep, i mean i've always things. i've always believed i've always held to that maxim all my life really that you know certainly since i was about 22 23 um which is a long time at uh, 40 years um that i've never failed at anything now, people around me would say otherwise, but that's their worldview, you know. Um, I, I think these words, failure and success, are, are so tied up, so emotive, that they can cause real problems uh, at a neurological level. So, you know, I've dropped those terminologies now. I just do something, and if it works, great. If it doesn't, great. <laughs> yep. It is what it it is what it is, you know. And yeah. I think it does take people a long time because we get trapped in this duality of good and bad. Um, I'm better, they're worse, you know, it which is endemic in the world and not just in Western society, but everywhere you go. Um, more so, I think, in developed cultures, 
in what we call the developed world uh, because we have more time on our hands to sit and think about this crap. Whereas if you're living in the third world, then you're trying to spend, and we've talked about this, haven't we, before, Baz, where yeah. you're spending most of your time just trying to survive. Just surviving is enough, you know, just to get water and food for your family. You've, you've had a good day. Whereas in our culture, food's red, readily available, lighting, heating, you know. We know for a fact we're sitting here in our lovely warm house. There's people living on the streets in this country, you know, yeah. and people will look down on them as if to say they're failures. Well, actually, it's a system that's collapsed, that's caused that. Um, you know, and the individuals have got to be obviously helped. And when you're that low down, it makes you wonder, you know, uh, I've often thought, would I be able to get up and start again? And I think I would. I think I would. Uh, because I've never worried about ending up homeless. It's not, it, it's just not entered my world view, as it were. So, I mean, I think everything you're saying is, is it, it certainly fits in with my ideas of, of, of how you should get on with things. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I you, mean, go on. Sorry, Baz. Sorry, I was going to say, like, you mentioned about the homeless people. And the thing is, like, this is why I never judge anyone because we have no idea what circumstances they've gone through or what led them to that point. So exactly. that's why I, I always try to be like empathetic and understanding yeah. of where they come from. I try to help them if I can, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really <laughs> don't know, do you? You don't know what. And and I think, I can't remember the Greek philosopher who said, I think it might have been, it might have been the Roman one, Plutarch, I don't know. He said, everybody's got their own battles. You know, be kind to everyone because we're, they've all got their own battles. <laughs> you know, I think it was Plutarch. I'll, I'll, probably somebody will come on YouTube and go, no, you fool, it was Heraclitus or Democritus. It was a long time ago. I mean, that, that phrase has been pinched recently by other people, as many of these maxims are. Um, but you go back to the Greeks and the Romans, and they had some really good ideas about how to live your life. Yeah. You know, the, Is that yeah, there's definitely examples of like, you know, celebrities who seem like they have it all, like they had the success, perceived success as the death defined by society, but then you find out like they had depression and then committing suicide as a result of that. So yeah. it's like, yeah, there's no point trying to feel jealous or, you know, be envious of, you know, yeah. what they have because yeah, like you say, you don't know what their problems are. Yeah. And the relative as well, like what could be a small issue for us could be a major burden for them. So the main yeah. thing is to just focus on ourself and be grateful for all we've got. Well, I mean, there was um, one of my clients from years ago who's an alcoholic. Uh, she was a millionaire, multi, multi millionaire, uh, but she had a problem with alcohol and depression. And she came to see me, uh, one of the NLP clinics that I used to run. And she said, she said something very telling. She said, The thing is, Bob, I'm financially rich, but emotionally poor. And I want, I want to get the other way around. I said, well, why not just have a balance? It's about being able to have that balance, isn't it? Because there's nothing wrong with being a millionaire. Because you can do a lot of good when you're a millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can do an awful lot of good. Um, um, but she obviously couldn't see that. And she wanted to do the opposite. And I said, is that really what you want? Because that's easy. Just give all your money away and then you'll have nothing. And then you can start again or accept that the money hasn't caused the problem, accept that actually there's something else going on here and we need to get a balance. So after a number of sessions, we, we got a balance anyway, and she was able to not get rid of alcohol completely, um, but just have the odd drink. Cause she said, I need to stop drinking. And I said, well, is that what you want? She goes, well, no, I used to like a drink now and again. Okay. Because sometimes when you go the opposite extreme, it's just as bad. You know, it's just as bad. So it's these people striving to be happy. I've got to be happy. You know, <laughs> oh my God, you invest in just live a fulfilling life and you'll find that life just is what it is. Some days it's crap. Other days it's, it's okay. It's, it, you're happy. It's a nice day, you know. But don't hang on to it because it, it will be subject to change. Yeah. Just as, as you proved, you know, your life, if you'd stayed with the people you were, you were hanging around with at school, if you'd stayed in that environment, 
maybe you, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you now. Probably not. And I don't know where I'd be, to be honest, because I felt like the same people who I was feeling jealous of in school, like it's, mm. like, it's like it bounces out, right? Like, even though I felt like I wanted to trade places back then, like if you ask me this question right now, I don't think I would. Like, I'm happy with where my life's gone right now. So yeah, it's just being, it's just being grateful for what you have and uh, just remembering that every everyone's journey is unique. And even though I may have struggled initially, but in the long term, like, you know, we will see success and it's thinking long term, yeah. which I think is a key. I think I think they're absolutely right. And I, like you say, everybody's got their struggles, you know, even those people who appear successful. You know, we see, like you say, we see these celebrities, don't we? We think, God, they've got everything. And then they kill themselves and you go, what was that about then? <laughs> How did that yeah. happen? I thought they seemed happy. <laughs> that was just a front. I mean, Robin Williams is a case in point. You Absolutely. know, everybody, we all assumed that Robin Williams had everything, uh, but he ended up, you know, hanging himself. He was that unhappy with what he had. And that's sometimes the case with comedians, strangely enough. Quite a lot of comedians. Yeah. Not me, like, but <laughs> although I'm yeah. not that. Yeah, I think that brings me to my next point, which is, you know, it's better to have that inner peace and mindfulness because that's what's going to triumph all the money, fame, success, which you get. Like, you've got to have that internal belief that you are enough and, you know, you've got everything you need. And whatever more I achieve is purely just a bonus, right? So yeah. that's the way That's the way to see it. Because yeah. I feel like the just it doesn't discriminate against people of wealth. Like, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, like, you know, it's going to affect everybody one way or another. Yeah. And like you say, don't let the stuff you have be the measure of what you would call success, whatever that is, you know. Or society's definition of success, which society's I... Society's definition, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's all relative, isn't it? Absolutely. Like, I don't have a million followers, but I don't care about that. Like, all I know is that even if the content I'm providing, like, if I'm able to benefit at least one person, then that's good enough for me. I agree completely with that. Somebody said to me, um, so how many, how many, yeah, you've only got, You've only got 60 followers on YouTube. And I was like, I said the same thing. I said, well, if one person's got something out of it, great. And if nobody's got anything out of it, guess what? I love doing it. <laughs> so it's a win-win. <laughs> you know, because I, I get to talk at a different level to people like yourself. Because obviously, in our normal life, I teach in Muay Thai. And you come to the meditation group on a Tuesday night. So we have a limited chance to talk at a personal level. So it's always an opportunity for me to meet the real person, as it were, the complete, you know, the total person as they are in that moment. And, you know, that's the great thing about interviewing people and doing podcasts. Uh, it not only allows you to find out more about that person and where they think, but actually you have to recalibrate your thought processes as well. And then sometimes people, the strangest people will say, the oddest things unwittingly, and you'll go, ooh, ooh, I'll have that. That's good. And you have to be like a like a magpie, you know, the bird that steals all those wonderful shiny things. That's yeah. what you've got to become. You've got to become like this magpie where you go, ooh, that's a good idea. I like that thought. I'm going to try. I used to do this when I was doing NLP with people, and I used to try on their strategies and see how it would make me feel. So, and I'd go, ooh, I don't like that. I'll keep that separate. And a, a good example is I had a girl who was very obese and she said she hated herself. She said she felt awful. She didn't want to look like this and that everything was wrong about her life and she was useless. And I said, ooh, hang on, hang on. Can't you see that you've succeeded in gaining weight incredibly I have girls who are anorexic who would kill for those strategies. So actually what you've got is a really powerful tool. You don't want it at the moment. So may I use your strategy to give to some of the girls who can't put weight on, who are stopping themselves eating. And she, she had a sudden change, like a shift. She went, oh, I'm, I said, I'm serious. I'm not, not, not joking. It's only useless to you. Don't think that. You're, you're perfect. This is what, I think this is what people forget. Everybody's perfect. They're doing what they can do with the choices they've got at that time. You, like you've just said it, haven't you? Uh, if you'd stayed in the place you were when you were younger, where you were being bullied and so on, and you hated school, 
if you'd stayed there, you would never made that shift, but you used whatever it was that you had inside of you to make that shift. And she saw, she then realized she wasn't, you, you were, you were working perfectly at that time, but then something came along that give you a new choice. And once you had those new choices, you were able to make that shift. And she, she completely, a whole physiology changed. She was like, I never thought of myself as being useful. I said, of course. I said, that is a brilliant skill. You don't want it, so I'm going to pinch it, and I'm going to give you another choice. So your new choice is to lose weight, to be healthier. She said, yeah, that's the choice I want to make. And it's all about choices. So when yeah. people say to me, when people say to me, oh, they're all screwed up, they're all messed up, I go, no, 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 they're not. They're working perfectly. It's just they are limited in their choices. So another human being should be able to come along and say, there are other ways to do this. Do you want to have a look at them? And if they're open to it, you've got change. Which is why when people listen to this podcast, people are going to link in with what you're saying and go, actually, I'm a bit like Baz when he was younger. Maybe I can do this as well. And that's what Absolutely. it's all about. Yeah, it's learning from others and being able to teach others and show them like what is truly possible and that nothing is set in stone because if i believed that life was set in stone back then then yeah i think <laughs> i don't think i'd be sitting on this podcast right now so. no we wouldn't we wouldn't or it'd be yeah. a very different podcast wouldn't it although yeah, i wouldn't well, i probably wouldn't have you on because you wouldn't be hanging around with the likes of me <laughs> <laughs> yeah but like we're on a similar wavelength so yeah that's that's always nice yeah yeah and and this is this is the good thing about a podcast sometimes you get people on who you don't think you're on the same wavelength with but then you realize actually we've got a lot in common here uh but not exactly the same obviously because we have a different way we perceive the world so you know something happened to you like a paradigm shift like a perception shift that that made you what you are today and I, of course you've said that it is constantly happening probably on a a minute by minute daily basis you know absolutely because you're opening yourself up to lots of influences now right it's a bit like your digital art isn't it you're using elements like that oh i like that i'll have that i'll put that on there oh and that one can go it's the same thing isn't it absolutely yeah process of bringing bringing to life an object from other parts of life yeah, and just experimenting with it just to see, you know, the possibilities. Like, see it's a show, showcasing, like, you know, what you can create using, like, editing software. And I think one of the reasons why I went into digital art was because, yeah, I actually started learning Photoshop when I was in, I think it was year seven or year eight. Oh, like, right, okay. From a young age, actually, because I think my school was hosting, like, some Photoshop classes. I had no idea what it was, but I thought, you know what, let me, let me give it a try. And then so I went and had a go, and it kind of just... I kind of just fell in love with the process like pretty much instantly and then I ran home to my dad saying dad dad I want I want to get the new software and so he bought me the software and yeah ever since then I've just been practicing like creations like when I first started I was not very good at it but as I kept improving and kept working on it like I gradually got better and better over time like in small increments right yeah. and then when you, do it, when you do it long enough like that's when you get to a certain level so I think it just shows that you know you need to have you need to have that patience and persistence like you know the first time you do anything like it's, it's not going to be great but if you're if it's something you're passionate about then you should embrace the challenges and face the pain face the pain uh, punch fear in the face and really just go through it and that's how you'll get better like it's about having that right mindset and when you make that shift like taking it as a challenge instead of seeing it as a struggle then you know you can really go far and also like uh, with digital art it's like yeah i mix it with photography as well mm -hmm. so what i'll do is i'll take photographs of my friends or models or sometimes myself and then i'll photoshop myself to look like a superhero or a movie star i saw i saw a couple of them on the instagram of stuart yeah i made him look like the hulk <laughs> yeah yeah you made him look like the hulk yeah. <laughs> yeah i think my thinking behind this is uh because a lot of you mentioned a lot of people have insecurities about how they look and things like that like i want to be able to use art to destroy limiting beliefs and build confidence in someone and make them realize that you know they are good enough like despite what the society or the media may have you believe like i just want to show it's possible for anybody to look to just feel good about themselves and feel like you know oh i am awesome so i think it, it definitely helps in that aspect so that's what helped me because i you know i don't look like a 
bodybuilder or Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I'm happy with how I look. Like, if you ask me to take a photograph, I'll happily do it. Mm. There's an interesting hypnotic phenomenon that a, a hypnotist called Milton Erickson used to use, and it was the as if model. Okay. And this guy was around in the 50s, so he was way ahead of the curve back then. And he was a hypnotherapist in, uh, in the United States. And he was renowned for being able to help people. You know, whoever went to see him sort of helped them sort their problems out. And he had a thing called the as if, the act as if. And it was basically act as if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. Act as if your you know whoever your favorite hero is because people you know I've, I've 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 worked with people before and i've said and it was one kid actually who was quite close to committing suicide and his mother asked me to see him and he um he saw him so i said well how do you how do you see yourself because he was blatantly making pictures in his head when he was talking about it. he was like this he was like scanning and his eyes were everywhere and I said, so when you when you see yourself, what do you see? And he, he said, I'm like that big. I'm that big and I'm at the bottom of this huge chasm, this ravine, and I can't get out. I said, oh, okay. I said, and I, I drew his attention to a post I had on his wall in his bedroom. I said, favorite film, is it? The Matrix. He went, I love it. I said, imagine if you were Keanu Reeves. Neo, imagine what you could do. I said, because at the moment, you're already plugged in, aren't you, to the system? And it's screwing with your head. And it's making you believe you're this big. So we unplugged him, right? And he was like, I mean, two sessions. And he he realized that he, he said, I'm like, Neil, I can move. I can do anything. And that was a major shift for him. And sometimes it's something simple. And it's quite interesting what you said about using digital art. You know, but you can do this inside your head. And of course, before you create anything, Baz, what do you do? You probably mentally see it. You know, you have an idea in your head. It's a thought, it's an idea, and you make it concrete by going online and doing it. It's what art is about, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes even just, even when I'm recreating like a popular movie poster, it's about knowing what techniques they use. And then making, I'm just showing people that it is possible to look like a movie star without actually being in industry which is like you know i want to help provide value in that sense mm. like just showing people that you know you, there's no need to feel self-conscious or insecure like you're already good enough as you are and you know you shouldn't determine beauty by the standards which the society or media sets it out and i feel like a lot of it's just bullshit mm. like hey you gotta you gotta be six feet tall or you gotta have abs or you gotta have this body to, to be good looking but i don't think that's true at all like you're already yeah. good enough yeah. as you are and you just gotta just own it right, basically just feel comfortable yeah. It's funny, isn't it, how um, you, when you, you, because I've worked in film and television, and when you meet some of these actors that you work with, you go, oh, they're a lot smaller than I thought. Oh, and he's got spots. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you go, oh, and he's gone to the toilet for a shit. <laughs> he just does all the same things that we do. And it's, it's what the media does with that image, isn't it? How they manipulate it. Um, and sometimes it's it's good that they can do that because it motivates people and makes them feel better. Uh, but of course, it can do the opposite, where people feel they look up to these images and then match themselves with those images and go, "Well, I'm not good enough," you know. I yeah. can't be as good as that. Well, that doesn't matter, does it? Because most of that's just imagery anyway. It's not real. Yeah, like if you see the before and after, like there's quite a big difference. And once you realise that, then it's like, oh, okay, that's that's yeah. how it works. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Uh, digital technology has always fascinated me anyway because I worked in motion capture. So I could be anybody I wanted to be. <laughs> I was yeah. made into all sorts of... I was James Bond in two games, you know what I mean? <laughs> I went, that's me, <laughs> James Bond. <laughs> yeah, mum, I made it. <laughs> but, you know, and if you get carried away, of course, then you become a narcissist, but you've just got to be careful. It's about balance. Again, it comes back to that thing about balance. Yeah, and I guess it's part of it comes down to, I guess, validation. Because I know that there were some girls who I knew who, like, I mean, they're, they're, they're attractive and good-looking, but then it's like, when I, when I get to know them more, it's like, you know, they have also these insecurities and these problems, which, you yeah. know, you wouldn't have guessed 
when you first meet them, but as you get to know them and dive deeper, then you realize that, oh, they've got the same struggles as everyone else. So it just shows that, you know, they're not all that the media portrays them out to be. Like, you know, everyone's got their own issues. And it's about just, uh, yeah, I feel like I'm rambling on for a bit. But No, no, not really. It's about you. We're talking about, it's that horrible word, which I bloody hate, but I'm going to have to use it, which is authentic. Just be yourself, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. and not not relying on validation from other people to determine your worth because that's I see that happen a lot where they'll be like, oh, they get loads of likes, oh, I feel good, but then suddenly because of the algorithm, like their likes likes drop, and then it starts to make them feel like just uh, not good about themselves, and yeah. you know it shouldn't have to be like that. Like I used to, I, I was guilty of this as well, but now it's like I just don't care anymore about the likes. Like as long as my content's out there, as long as people are gaining value from it, then that's all that matters to me. I agree completely. Um, my web designer guy, Murray, who you've met online, he um, is working every day on stuff that I'm doing. And I said, look, don't worry about it. You know, he said, oh, we're not getting as much on it. I said, doesn't matter. doesn't matter. Just keep doing what we're doing. I said, look, I could sell out. And if I started doing YouTube videos on angelic Reiki or some bizarre magical healing nonsense and fairies and astrology and stuff like that, of course I'd get millions of followers because people are gullible and people want that consolatory belief system. But I won't, I won't do that, obviously. I, I don't feel that's right. And I could be the next Jordan Peterson if I chose. But I don't want to be Jordan Peterson because he got stuck on Benzedrine, didn't he? he? Nearly killed himself. You know, I think I put a post up on Instagram yesterday uh, that somebody had shared. And these gurus, these help gurus, self-help gurus, create this need with people. So you have to go back to them time and time again. I would hate that. If I help someone, I never want to see them again because otherwise I've, it means it didn't work. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, feel that, I feel like there's a lot of misinformation out there on the internet. Oh. And yeah. uh, it's hard to find, like, you know, who's genuine and who's not. So it's all about just finding someone who you resonate with and getting the best value for money. Like if you were to pay for a life coach or a dating coach or whatever. For yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's, it reminds me like of Stuart. He has his channel, Physical and Mental Strength. Like I actually connected with him through uh, a, a, a personal development group online, which was a, which I believe was run by a YouTuber called How to Beast. I don't know if you've heard of How to Beast. No, no. I'll have a look at that. Yeah, like I think he did a mentorship program, which I think Stuart was a part of. Ah, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they know each other somehow. So, yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I reached out to Stuart and then I found out like he was also part of Muay Thai. So, realizing that it is a small world. And yeah, that's how I got in touch with him, basically. Right. Um, so, it was through. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, what got you into Muay Thai? Why Muay Thai? Uh, to be honest with you, uh, I actually grew up watching like martial arts movies. So like Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee. I even saw some from like uh, East Asia. I don't know if you're familiar with like the Hong Kong film industry or Thailand or Indonesia. Yeah. Yeah. So it's movies like uh, Ong Bak. Uh, Bak, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony Jaa. Mm -hmm. And uh, The Raid. I don't know if you saw The Raid. Yeah, The Raid. I know these. I know them all. My friend, uh, Bear Logan, was involved um, with the... Um, the Shaw brothers um, in Hong Kong who produced the first Kung Fu films and uh, the Bruce Lee films. And Bear, um, Bear Logan used to be the editor of Combat back in the uh, early, early 80s when Combat first started, end of the 70s, early 80s uh, in Birmingham. And he used to train with me and he now lives in Hong Kong. Uh, so yeah, oh, I'm, I love Jackie Chan, better than Bruce Lee. And now people are going to hate me, obviously, for saying that. But Jackie Chan was far better actor and a much better performer on screen than Bruce Lee. And I know I'm going to get shot down by the few people who watch this now, but I maintain that Bruce Lee wasn't a brilliant actor. He was OK. Um, and I can say that because I'm a trained actor uh, and his, his martial arts were good, but he wasn't as good as Jackie Chan. Yeah, I don't know what, you, what do you think? What do you Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, which one? Who do you think? To be, fun, to be honest, I, I, I can't say too much about Bruce Lee, but I think in terms of Jackie Chan, like I've seen more of his movies. So yeah. from what the I know, movies. I liked what I saw with Jackie Chan. Yeah. And I love the stunts. And then, of course, on back, I mean, that just, I mean, the stunts in that are just phenomenal. 
Yeah, there's also, I believe, Ip Man with uh, Donnie Yen. I don't know if you I haven't that watched one. those yet. I haven't watched them. Um, I mean, I have got Netflix and Amazon and that, and I've been me- they keep coming up as recommended, um, and I will watch one of them at some point. So I, I'm, I've heard good things about them. I'm not a big fan of, because uh, it's, uh, it's obviously it's not real, um, so I'm not a big fan. I watch them with a martial arts eye, uh, and sometimes you've got to drop that and go, just enjoy it for what it is. It's a bit of fun, which is what I can do with Jackie Chan because he's so funny anyway. So he, obviously Jackie Chan does not take himself seriously. I oh, definitely not. Which is, <laughs> which is what is great about him. And of course he does all of his own stunts. Yeah, it's impressive to be uh... Impressive little fella, um, incredible. And when I first saw him compared to Bruce Lee, I thought, oh, who is this guy? He's faster, he's funnier, he's he's more athletic. This guy's incredible. <laughs> so I wonder if Bruce Lee hadn't died, what would have happened there, you know? I mean, I guess, uh, I don't know, it sounds horrible for me to say, but I guess things do happen for a reason. Like maybe things would have been a lot different if you hadn't died. Yeah, maybe, no, maybe. well, there would have been, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Would have been popular as he would be right now. I don't um, know, because... I don't know. I think he'd have been a successful, he would have run probably a chain of very successful martial arts schools because his partner in crime, Dan Inosanto, still does that with the Jeet Kune Do. And Jeet Kune Do is huge all over the world, you know. Uh, But Jeet Kune Do has become very convoluted now. I don't feel that it's sticking to the principles that Bruce and Dan Inosanto aspired to, which was to keep things as simple as possible and get away from a classical mess. Now what you've got in the Jeet Kune Do is, you know, you've got guys trying to train in Muay Thai, in Jiu Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, Eskrima, uh, Wing Chun, and, and, and they're trying to build up. I mean, you know, how long have you got to live, you know? Um, you're not going to master all of them. Whereas Bruce, Bruce's original idea was to get away from the classical mess and just take what is useful. But of course, that's easy for him to say because he was already a trained martial artist. And the danger is, of course, like with the mixed martial arts, people think they can become experts at a couple of things after maybe a year or two, when in fact they have a basic grasp of the fundamentals. But that's another story. That's another podcast altogether, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, I can talk about I can talk about martial arts like how I got into it, actually. So uh, yeah, I- no, that'd be interesting because you know uh, people who listen to this. Do, do listen for martial arts as well. So, yeah, so you watched lots of martial arts films when you were younger. So, yeah, go on, expand. Yeah. And uh, another reason, another motivation for me for taking part in martial arts is because, like, you know, I went, as I told you, like, I went through a lot of bullying in school, like, both physically and verbally. And it's mm-hmm. like, I kind of felt helpless in those situations. And there's also, like, you know, that part of your brain, the amygdala, where it registers all these traumatic experiences. Yeah. It's like, you know, you, you start having this fear of like, you know, oh, what's going to happen next? And it ends up not taking action. So essentially yeah. I had to get over this fear of like, you know, you just not be, just not be scared of people and just stand your ground and yeah, just go for what you want. Yeah. So yeah, like I was lacking confidence for a long time. Like, like if you, if you go to like 16 or 17, like I knew people who were having like girlfriends and things like that. Like I had none of that. And right. I, all I did was just study for my exams. So in that sense, yeah, I'm quite a late bloomer. Like I've not actually, I've not actually been in any relationships yet. Believe it or not. Well, relationship with human beings, but you mean yeah. girls specifically. Yeah, I'm talking about girls, yeah. Yeah, so if there's any girls out there, quite like the look of this chap, he's a nice guy. <laughs> I get like blind date, this, except it's not blind date. You can see what you're going to get. Normally his hair's not like that, girls. It's normally all, and it's long and flowing. And unless you've cut it all off, have you? Or you've tied it back well, it. Good. Yeah, you've smartened yourself up. He's got a good head of hair, girls, and a sense of humour. So why not give Baz a look? <laughs> Contact me for more details. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because of that yeah i was lacking confidence for a long time so i felt like oh if i start with a martial art then you know maybe it'll help me to get in better shape of course and of course to build my confidence like physical and mental strength yeah i was talking about like i actually started with kickboxing in my second year because i had a close friend of mine who i met in that second year of university like he was he told me he was doing kickboxing so right thought, okay why not why don't i give that a go and i really i really enjoyed it because it really helped me to 
not only build my confidence, but I guess defend for myself so that, you know, yeah. if we got into a situation where a potential fight could happen, like rather than jumping into a fight, it's more like, okay, if I can find an opportunity to walk away rather than get involved in stupid fights, then it's better to take the sensible option and only like use self-defense if you really have to. So I feel like I'm in that point in my life where, you know, if someone tried to start my fight, like I will try my best to mm. basically not escalate it even further. And I think the, having that confidence to like, being able to know, knowing that, you know, you can defend yourself in those situations definitely helps a lot. And, okay. you know, I, because because of kickboxing, I ended up progressing into like Muay Thai, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Taekwondo and MMA. And uh, yeah, that's how I got into, you know, just uh, continuously improving myself in terms of, you know, being able to defend. So like, I used to watch YouTube videos. Like, I don't know if you know Ginger Ninja Trickster. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> He does like Taekwondo videos. And, oh, uh, right. Okay. And I was watching videos online, like how to improve my techniques. And, you know, I used to do that like after school, after, after university classes, like lectures, like back in the day. And, you know, that's like, that's definitely helped in terms of, you know, building my confidence and just knowing that, you know, I've got some value in some way, shape, or form. And it's a fun thing to do. Like, who doesn't want to fight like Jackie Chan, right? Or Tony Chan. Yeah, exactly. No, no, no. I agree. Yeah, um, so I've been trying to I've been trying to get like that all my life. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, the journey still continues, <laughs> even though I can barely walk. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely a cool hobby to get into. And yeah, it's something it's something interesting to talk about, like you know, when you're hanging around with friends or whatever. So yeah, it's always a I mean, there's benefit. There's so many benefits to it. Like, it's hard to list them all, like into this podcast. But generally, it's worth doing. But I feel like what I've noticed with a lot of people is they feel hesitant because it's like, because obviously with martial arts it's quite a steep learning curve, right? And there's a lot of you have to go through a lot of pain in order to get better. Because I know the first time I did sparring, like I got absolutely thrashed. Yeah. <laughs> I think you remember the first session I went to. It was actually a sparring session. Yeah, but you came back. <laughs> I'm still alive. <laughs> and a lot of people, a lot of people don't come back. You know, I'll, they'll say, I want to do the sparring. And I'll say, well, you're not ready yet, but I want to. Okay, come along. We'll take it easy. And we do. We take it sort of easy, but it's still terrifying. And it always feels like you're way out of your depth. Because, of course, you are. You've never sparred before. So, of course, you're out of your depth. It's like not being able to swim and getting thrown in the pool, isn't it? Literally. Yeah. Uh, you you can read about swimming, but if you don't take the dive, you're not, you're not swimming. Exactly. No. And that's the good thing about um, the students at the university. Back in the day, back in the 80s, when I first set it up, nobody wanted to spar. Um, the classes didn't have anybody sparring um, at all, and which I thought was odd. Because uh, to me, that's what Muay Thai is about. And, um, and it wasn't until the mid-90s when there was a, a shift in the way people trained and um, a couple of guys came to my gym and said, why don't we have a sparring class at the uni? And I said, well, the last time we tried that, nobody, nobody came. There was like one guy turned up. So we set it up and lo and behold, the fighters classes ended up being bigger than the, the, the normal, what, what I would call commercial classes where there's no sparring. Because I, I want everybody to enjoy it. And that's why I have two separate classes. I don't want to scare people off. I understand most people, if they've got a brand, they don't want to damage it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like uh, for anybody listening, if they're thinking about joining martial arts and that fear is coming in, just punch that fear in the face and it's all good. Yeah. And, and you can punch somebody else in the face for real if you join Muay Thai. <laughs> even better. <laughs> yeah, which is even more fun. You think, oh, I've got him, I've got him, I've got him. <laughs> At last, I've been trying for weeks to get this guy and I managed to pop him, you know. And, and yeah, I think, I think, uh, I mean, I've, I'm obviously a fan of the martial arts. I've done them since I was 10 years old. You know what I mean? So 54 years of, of doing this and I've seen more benefits from it than any, any other sport, to be honest. Oh, definitely. I've, you know, I've played other sports and been involved in other sports, but always come back to the martial arts because so diverse we're all doing different things, different styles, but using the same tools. You know, it shows how how amazing the human mind can be. It's like coming back to your digital art. You know, you can have a number of images, put them together in one way. Another digital artist come along and do something completely different. You'll go, whoa, different, different same style. images. How do you do that? 
it's like the same software, but we all have different editing styles. And you'll definitely notice it like when you check out the other Instagram accounts, like yeah. on there. So. Yeah. Well, that, the, yeah. The word martial art, it's an art. There you go. Yeah, I mean, my, my last teacher of, of Muay Thai, Pimu, said Muay Thai is a beautiful art. He said it should be beautiful. And you know, I've always I've always gone with that. Shouldn't be aggressive, shouldn't be brutal, it should be beautiful. Like the Thai language you used to say, beautiful, lilting, soft and gentle, finds its way in. Boom, boom, boom. And you can watch when you watch the Thais fighting, there is a certain amount of beauty to it and grace, isn't it? That balance, the way we move is very different to kickboxers or karate or boxing or you know. But again, yeah. you know. They're all art. Boxing is an art, isn't it? When it's done properly. Yeah, I think it's all about just finding what works for you and what you resonate with the most. Like for me, Muay Thai resonates with me. Muay Thai and Taekwondo, they resonate with me the most. So that's why I enjoy doing them. And even Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, like there's definitely certain elements of that which I like. I mean, yeah. partly because I'm a fan of the John Wick movies and Tony Jaa. I'm a big fan boy of Tony Jaa. Tony Jaa was absolutely brilliant. Um, there's a there's um, Tony Jaa was supposed to do a film about prior Peach Eye, but I think didn't Bokau end up doing it? Uh, no idea. I, I, I only saw yeah. that on the back end. Well, it's actually out. It's a film because you know the name of the camp is Prior Peach Eye. I've, in fact, I've got one of the shirts on. Um, yeah. And that that's the swordsman that I believe Bokau played the part of of um, of Prior Peach Eye. And I know the film's out, but Tony Jaa was supposed to be playing the character, but something happened. So, and I've seen clips of the film. It looks amazing. You know, in the same style as Ong Bak as well. Oh, wow. It's about the life of Prior Pichai, the swordsman, who was also a Thai boxer, you know. Yeah, I think it's impressive how he's able to keep in shape despite all those years since Ong Bak. Since I know it's been a while since that movie's come out. Oh, yeah, God, yeah. 2002 or something, wasn't it? Something like, something like that, or 2003. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 2003, maybe. Uh, but, yeah. Um, but he's still fairly young, isn't he? Yeah. Relatively. Yeah. Well, not as young as before, but still young, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have thought so, like. Uh, but, obviously, as a stuntman, his days are numbered, you know. Yeah. I don't know if you saw, like, Fast and Furious 7, where he was in it for a bit. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is probably going to be a bit controversial, but I wasn't a big fan of how they made like Paul Walker like easily beat Tony Jaa in the fight. Oh no, no, no! That's yeah. ridiculous. Absolutely yeah. ridiculous. But hey, <laughs> it's the movies. <laughs> it's like, not real. <laughs> it's like for Tony Jaa, like he can easily kill fifty guys in on back. <laughs> yeah, in one minute. <laughs> but then in this movie, it's like he's struggling to be a Hollywood actor. So when you came to Muay Thai, I hope you weren't expecting us to be jumping up in the air with double elbows and double knees. <laughs> That's what you wanted to do. Actually, I expected uh, one of my friends to do that. Well, I mean, I did. I, I used to have a, a little team that used to do demos back in the day, back in the 90s. And we used to do demos with the weapons, the swords, the, the staff, the spear, the shield, and the empty hand, the cellar, and the Muay culture. And the Muay culture is what don't Tony Jaa sort of uses. It's very fancy, um, very theatrical Muay Thai. It's called Muay culture. Or some people call it Muay Boran. That's the more common term you've probably heard. Yeah, I've come across that. The yeah. term is Muay culture, um, which is the old style. I can still teach that as it happens. Um, and I have actually done a, a seminar on it at the university a few years ago, where there's about 10 guys said, can we... Can we learn this stuff? I went, yeah, come on then. <laughs> so we were doing Naga Badhing and Jawa Sadhok and all of the maze and leaping up in the air things. Yeah, it's kind of kind of like how I asked you to teach some Tony Jaa moves. That, that yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and we could, <laughs> uh, except I couldn't do it anymore. But I can get Tom Sweetman to come in. He can do it. Tom's very young. Tom's very good at that sort of stuff because he's trained me a long time. If he's listening. He might be at some point. But uh, no, so we've gone from, it's been quite a fascinating journey. Um, it's funny because at the beginning, you before we came on air, Baz was saying how I, he wasn't sure whether we were able to talk about anything. And now we've done an hour. We've actually done an hour. So I think 
Um, and if you're up for it, I think there's room for another one in here, you know. Oh, I'll take that one. I'll right. take the challenge. Well, let's, let's, let's close the show for tonight because people only listen for about an hour at the most and then they start switching off. Let's keep their interest and let's talk about another subject when we come on. And now, just for the people that are watching, Baz comes on the meditation group. And when I say, have we got a topic to discuss this evening? Because we discuss things on the meditation group as well as meditate. Baz is always the first one to put his hand up and we all look at his screen and we all wait with bated breath. And Baz always comes up with something interesting. So I'm going to put you on the spot, Baz. What are you going to talk about in the next podcast? <laughs> the next po podcast? Oh, that's a good question. You're definitely putting me on the spot there. I have put you on the spot. Yeah, I can talk about uh, why it's so important to surround yourself with the right people, how I overcame my anxieties and struggles regarding social skills and things like that. And also talking about some destructive habits, some particular ones which have really helped me back. And then, of course, I'm on that journey to putting that behind me and then overcoming that and becoming a better version of myself for tomorrow. Okay. That sounds brilliant. So Baz, I just want to thank you very much for coming on tonight. Again, as I've said, you never know what you're going to get when you do a podcast, even when you know the people, uh, but it's, it's certainly I've enjoyed it and I'm sure other people will as well. And if people want to um, obviously have a look down in the comments box, put some comments in, have a look at the description and you'll find some links to Baz's Instagram account and his YouTube account. That's right, isn't it, Baz? Yeah, that's Good right. Man. And if you want any digital art done, guys, Baz is the man. All right. Absolutely. So I just want to thank you very much, Baz. All right. Pleasure. Thank you, Matt.